everyone, welcome back to Homegrown Passion. Today's video, Doug's going to go over his grow bags that he did for the strawberries. And then Nathan Donnelly from Crop King came out for a visit and we went over powdery mildew and blossom end rot, two of the fun things in the greenhouse. So stay tuned. So I wanted to do an update on the grow bags that we did. Um, at first I was telling everybody that I was going to pull the drip tape through these bags with a wire and that really didn't work too well. So I got a little piece of uh, rebar that I had, just a real thin piece of rebar tied some tape to it. And this, I was able to actually poke it through the bag and I could kind of send it the way I wanted to. So this worked really well. I just tied it to the drip tape that was down at the end and I just pulled it all the way through all the bags one at a time. And then I got it situated and I did the same valves on the end that I did with the other strawberries. I put a valve on the end on this side and then I dropped a nutrient line down to this side so it waters the whole system all at once. The next thing I did was I went through with the razor knife. First I made a storyboard with an old paint stick just to measure it out and I just put uh, dots on it with a permanent marker. And then I took my razor knife and I just made X's. Now I was telling you before and Katie said something about me taking a pipe and putting an edge on it so I could just cut the holes in. But I thought, you know what, that's a lot of work. So I just took a razor knife and cut an X and it seems to work really well. And to push the roots in, I just took an old paint stick and I cut a groove in the bottom of it. And let me show you how that works. So this is the rest of the straw. This is the balance of them. We got the whole row planted. And so what I do is I just take this, put the roots into the edge like that, and push it in. Simple. Seems to work really well. Again, you just I could push them right underneath that drip tape and they pack in perfect. I think I really like this idea because these grow bags are going to keep all the stuff off the top. We won't have to worry about those strawberries into the growing medium. And I'm, I'm having a really good feeling that this is going to work out really well. So. So I know it's late in the season to get these in, but we had them in the refrigerator and we don't like to waste them. So I think this is just a really good way to do it. And it gives us an opportunity to try to do something different. So I'm really liking this idea. I think this thing's gonna turn out to be sweet and really good for strawberries. So we will keep you informed and we'll go from there. Nathan Donnelly here with Crop King out at Bradwood Farms again today. Uh, Katie made the comment that she started seeing some white fuzzy stuff on one of her cucumbers and this white fuzzy stuff on this cucumber is powdery mildew. So powdery mildew is a fungus that is species specific. So what that means is the powdery mildew that gets on cucumbers is not the same powdery mildew that gets on tomatoes, which is not the same powdery mildew that gets on lettuce. Um, 
when we go through and we look at these cucumbers, we've got several different varieties and we're only seeing powdery mildew on this one variety. So that indicates to me that this particular variety that we're growing here does not have much, if any, uh, powdery mildew resistancy bred into it. Uh, but what this does indicate to me is that the environment here in the greenhouse is conducive to growing powdery mildew. So my recommendation would be to go through and start go doing preventative application sprays for powdery mildew. The products that I would recommend active ingredients would be um, potassium bicarbonate um, and the other one would be a bacillus subtilis type product and both of those are OMRI listed which means they're good for organic production. Um, have what I believe products out there have four hour REIs and a zero day PHI. So REI stands for restricted entry interval which basically means that is the amount of time that has to elapse from your application until you can be in the crop again. Um, PHI is pre-harvest interval, which is the amount of time that has to elapse before you are allowed to go through and harvest produce off of these plants. Again, those OMRI listed products um, that I'm referring to are four hour REI and zero day PHI. So as soon as that REI were to go through and expire, you'll be allowed to come in here and pick the produce off of those plants. So going through here and looking at the tomatoes here, we've seen very few examples of blossom end rot. So blossom end rot on tomatoes is caused by calcium deficiency. So when we say calcium deficiency, that does not necessarily mean that we are not giving these plants enough calcium. It simply means that the calcium is not getting into the plant and that can be from a number of different causes. Um, suspect number one typically from my experience is that the EC in the bucket has gotten too high which is basically preventing the uptake of nutrients, mainly calcium, into the plant. Uh, so when we talk about our target ECs, we have our supply EC and we have our runoff EC. The supply EC is what's going through and coming from our fertilizer injector and going out to the plants. Our runoff EC is the EC that is coming out of the bucket. Uh, general rule of thumb is that I do not want to see a runoff EC more than 0.3 above my supply EC. So for example, if we're supplying these tomatoes with an EC of 2.0, I wouldn't want to see an EC any higher than 2.3 coming out of these buckets. If I go through and I do see an EC that is higher than 2.3, what I'm going to do is potentially a multiple different options we've got, right? We can either go through and increase the time in which our irrigation runs. We can go through and decrease the time interval between irrigation events. Or if my EC is very, very high, so let's say 0.5 or more above, I'm gonna go through and reduce my supply EC and increase my time that it's gonna run so that I can flush some of those salts that have accumulated around the roots out. So calcium and boron are the only two nutrients that are taken into the plant through transpiration meaning that we have to have active water movement through the plant to be pulling calcium and boron into the plant. All the other nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, work through positive and negative exchanges of ions and cations, chemistry stuff, right? Um, so if we are in experiencing hot, humid conditions, there's less transpiration going on, which goes through means we're pulling less calcium up into the plant. Um, in those cases, where we know we look at our extended weather forecast and we see that we're gonna be cloudy and rainy for the next three days. Um, you might consider coming through and making a foliar application of calcium uh, to go through and basically cover these leaves with that calcium foliar spray solution so that that calcium can be absorbed through the leaf cuticle and then distributed throughout the plant as it goes through and sees fit. So what the plant's doing when we end up with blossom end rot is that it is stealing the calcium from the fruit, which is the easiest place for it to go through and get calcium from, and moving it to the growing point of the plant. Because calcium is very, very important in the development of the cell wall, right? And so where we've got the cell wall developing the most is gonna be up here in the growing tip, right? So the plant is essentially in survival mode. So if you kind of think of it of like us with hypothermia or frostbite, the main part of our body that keeps us going is gonna be our brain and our heart, right? So we go through and our body goes through and narrows the capillaries that are in our fingers to concentrate our blood, which goes through and keeps us warm. 
around our heart and our brain, the plant's essentially doing the same thing. It's stealing the calcium from the fruit to go through and supply it to the growing tip that it needs to go through and continue to survive. If that growing tip were to die out, this plant would die out because after the last fruit ripens, this plant is done. So the question came up about running the same nutrient recipe for cucumbers, tomatoes, and beans. And in a perfect world where money is no object, yes, we could go through and put in three different nutrient injection systems and run three different nutrient recipes uh, on these different crops, but nutrient injection systems are expensive, right? So from a business standpoint, we have to go through and look at things on ROI, right? Return on investment. And on this scale, the cucumbers, the tomatoes, and the beans are a complementary crop to the greens that Bradwood Farms goes and grows. So, and this, we've got five rows that are 40 feet long. So basically it's been decided that we can still grow marketable, good, fresh produce to go through and sell on a single recipe. Now, if Bradwood came to me and said that the cucumber market is exploding and we're gonna go through and add on another greenhouse and we're gonna do a 22 foot by 128 foot greenhouse and we're just gonna grow cucumbers, at that scale, we would want to go through and optimize our production so we would go through and incorporate our own injection system and own fertilizer recipe for the cucumbers. But at this scale, like I said, we can go through and produce a viable crop that comes in on time. Is our yield going to go through and be impacted slightly? Yes, but on this scale, when we go through and look at it from a business standpoint, the ROI of these individual recipes for these just doesn't make sense because we can go through and still grow at this scale a viable product that we can make money in. So the grow bags are working out great. The strawberries all came up. Looks like most of them are alive. I've got a few at the end that um, so far I haven't greened up, but maybe we'll still pull those out. The only thing I've done different since we've talked last is I poked a hole in the bottom of the bag on the downward slope. It's just allowing a little bit of water out, but I think they're doing really well. Looks like they're coming up well, so we should uh, say this is a positive for the grow bags. So we've got some really good pictures from one of our subscribers sent us, and I'm gonna post those at the end of the video. But she's doing a great job with hydroponics. She's growing them in her house, and she's got just a ton of different things going, and it looks like she's really successful at it. So if you've got pictures that you'd like us to highlight, we'd be more than happy to put it up on the video. If you're doing some unique things with hydroponics, or beto buckets, or any of the other things that uh, we all like to grow, send them over. The address is in the description of the video and um, or the email and also texting you can do that too but uh, we'd love to see your pictures and I'd love to put them up on the video so well I hope you guys liked today's video I learned a lot from Nathan he's always very informative so like always leave me any questions comments and suggestions down below and we'll see you guys next video <laughs> <laughs>